In this video, we're reviewing crew consultations, specifically when and how we should get together on a call to ensure we get the play right. Now, a quick disclaimer is that these policies may vary depending on the level or league, but most of the philosophies and mechanics for umpires will be the same. So we'll start the video by reviewing the rules associated with crew consultations, and then we'll run through the mechanics of a crew consultation as given in the manual for minor league umpires combined with the philosophies of NFHS and GHSA baseball. After that, we'll review examples of in-game consultations, and finally, we'll break down this week's case plays. Now, if you want to see how well you can do on this week's case plays before reviewing it with me, you can find a link to it in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball, Umpire Development, and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out the rest of our videos. Also, if you want next week's case plays emailed to you, there's a link in the description to sign up. Starting with the rules book, there's only one rule that hints at when and how umpires may get together on a call. Rule 10-1-4. Any umpire's decision which involves judgment, such as whether a hit is fair or foul, whether a pitch is a strike or a ball, or whether a runner is safe or out, is final. But if there is reasonable doubt about some decision being in conflict with the rules, the coach or captain may ask that the correct ruling be made. The umpire making the decision may ask another umpire for information before making a final decision. No umpire shall criticize or interfere with another umpire's decision unless asked by the one making it. This is all the instruction the rules book gives, so let's break it down. First, the rule starts by asserting that a true judgment call is final and gives several examples. Now, we all know that calls such as balls and strikes are not open for argument or debate, and there's two reasons why. The first is that if we opened up every pitch to challenges and questioning, the game would take forever and we wouldn't be able to play the game. But the second reason is even more important to our philosophy on getting plays right. The plate umpire in his or her position behind the catcher has the best view of anyone at the game as to whether a pitch is a ball or strike. That's why they're back there. That doesn't mean they won't miss pitches, but we have to trust that the umpire in the best position and solely focused on the pitch, made the right decision. The minor league umpire manual gives several calls that are not subject to reversal. These include steals and other tag plays, except if the ball is dropped without the umpire's knowledge, force plays, when the ball is not dropped and the foot is not pulled, and balls and strikes, except for check swings. And they point out that some calls cannot be reversed without creating larger problems, such as catch and no catch calls. Now, the next part of the rule states that a coach may ask that the umpires get together if there is a question about an umpire's decision conflicting with the rules. In reality, this doesn't happen very often, but may most commonly occur with questions around some of the various NFHS rules like the player DH. However, we will also interpret this rule to include the crew getting together on calls where the calling umpire may be able to get additional information from another umpire. And when we do get together to discuss a call, the calling umpire is still the one who will make the final decision. And the final decision is exactly that, final. Lastly, the rule also states that umpires will not criticize or interfere with another umpire's decision unless asked by the one making it. The purpose of this rule is to say that if you see something different or think your partner got it wrong, we don't immediately overrule them or tell them what we have. You never know exactly what your partner saw and your partner was still probably in a better position to see the overall play. So unless asked, save your feedback or thoughts till after the game. Now, real quickly before closing the rules book, I do want to remind you of rule 10-1-5, the use of videotape or equipment by game officials for the purpose of making calls or rendering decisions is prohibited. So now let's dive into the philosophies of crew consultations and getting the call right. First, our ultimate responsibility is to get the call right. And before a coach even comes out to ask you about a call or getting help, there's a lot we can and should have done to help us make the right call. This includes moving to the best position possible, having our heads set for the play, using good timing to see the entirety of the play, and understanding how the rules apply to that play. All of this can many times keep you from needing to get help. Remember, if you're 100% confident in your judgment and your view of the play, then you aren't required to get help. You are at the game for a reason, and that reason is for you to make these judgments. And your partner is usually two or three times further away from the play than you, 
So it's important to remember that you probably had a better view of the entirety of a play. The guideline here is that coaches are not entitled to a second opinion simply because they dispute a call. That said, the minor league manual perfectly describes when an umpire is urged to seek help. It says, an umpire is urged to seek help when the umpire's view is blocked or positioning prevents such umpire from seeing crucial elements of a play. An umpire is also encouraged to seek help in instances when that umpire has doubt and a partner has additional information that could lead to a proper ruling. Now, this is less likely to happen in a crew of four umpires, but as we go down to two umpires, we run into a lot of situations where we have to take a worse angle and distance on a play than if we were working in a crew of four. For example, let's take a play with a runner on third base in a crew of two. Our base umpire starts in the C position and we have a ground ball to F6 that is thrown to F3 and F3 stretches towards the mound to catch the ball and potentially pulls his foot. For U1 and a crew of two, they may get the best view possible of this play, but it isn't anywhere close to as good of a view as they would have had in a crew of four. We should know this as the base umpire because our plate umpire, while further away, may have seen something different about the pulled foot. Now, if we call the batter runner out and no one comes out to ask about it, then stick with your call. You probably got it right. And if the coach of the offensive team does come out, see what they have to say. They may just complain that the batter runner beat the ball, which is a judgment call that we won't get together on. But if they say F3 pulled his foot, you may wanna ask your partner for help. Again, the important part is that we use consultations when a crucial piece of information may be missing. Now, when an umpire seeks help, they should do so shortly after making the call. Don't have a lengthy conversation with the coach prior to getting help. In the example we just talked about, if the coach starts by arguing that his batter runner simply beat the ball, then we aren't going to allow him to bring the conversation to a pulled foot later. In that situation, trust your call. But if the coach does come out and immediately argue that F3 pulled his foot, don't have a lengthy conversation. If you think the plate umpire may have additional information, go ahead and get together. But remember, when we get together, the decision coming out of that is final. Now, on this note, some crews will decide on a signal before the game to show their partner if they believe they have crucial information on a play. Personally, the signal I like is for the umpire with additional information to simply start moving in the direction of the calling umpire. I know other crews have done things like taking off their hat, which is acceptable as well. That said, if you are the calling umpire and you are 100% confident in your call, then it is still up to you if you wanna get help. Also, just because your partner isn't giving you a signal doesn't mean you can't get together. Sometimes we may get together with 99% confidence you'll keep the call, but we get together to confirm your partner is nothing different and to satisfy the coach's request for you to get help. It also adds a definitive end to the coach's time he can argue a call. Next, let's cover how to hold the crew consultation. First, we need to do so away from the coaches and players. To ensure this, different leagues have different policies, but for our GHSA games and most other NFHS and youth level games, the coach that asked about the call must return to the dugout or if on offense, can return back to the coach's box, but we cannot and should not have our consultation until they have done just that. This is because if you uphold the call, nothing else can be done about it, and there is no discussion to be had. Any further discussions from the coach after the consultation will result in an automatic restriction of the dugout and possible ejection. When we get together, we always bring the entire crew. The first reason is that you never know when an unlikely umpire on the crew may have pertinent information. The second reason is that for situation handling, if we are going to reverse a call, it's important that the entire crew is on the same page. When we get into the discussion, it should be conducted by the crew chief. Ultimately though, the decision to change the call belongs to the umpire who made the original decision. Then when the consultation ends, the original calling umpire will signal the final decision. Now, before giving the final decision, the umpire crew needs to discuss how it will handle reversing the call in terms of who will talk with whom. It is also up to the discretion of the umpires whether to communicate with the manager of the team the call has gone against before or after signaling the reversal of the call. By telling them before giving the ultimate final signal, we can help manage the situation when we have a very complex call. That said, when you go over to talk to them, they will know and everyone at the game will know you're about to reverse the call. And in situations where it is obvious why we are changing the call, such as a pulled foot or drop ball, there really isn't anything to discuss, 
So go ahead and give the final decision. Remember, when a call is reversed, the coach is entitled to an explanation. However, they're not allowed to argue the change. The change is final and is only made because the umpires are doing the best of their abilities to accomplish our number one goal, to get the call right. Now, if you wanna see a great example of this with umpires from the College World Series wearing mics, you can find a link to it in the video description. Also, if you wanna get access to our cheat sheet for these different guidelines, you can find a link to it in the video description as well. Next, let's review several in-game examples of crew consultations. Here's our first case play. We're gonna have a catch-no-catch -no -catch decision with a runner on second and no outs. Now, this is definitely a hard call here, especially turning on the play as the base umpire. But after looking at this in slow motion, I definitely think we had a catch on this and that the fielder dropped it, taking it out of his glove. Now, this next part is where it's going to get fairly complicated. You're going to see the base umpire start giving the signal of taking it out of the glove and then give a catch signal. Now, while this looks confusing, the first time through when I talked to the umpire after the situation, he said that the safe mechanic he gave was actually on the runner going back to second, but he never gave a no-catch mechanic for the catch-no-catch. No catch and that's why he was coming back to give the out mechanic. So after discussing with the coach, the base umpire agrees to get with his plate umpire to discuss the call. Now remember, when we get together for a conference, the coach is required to go back to the dugout, or in this case, since he was the third base coach, back to the coach's box. The umpire crew fails to properly get him back on this play, and that's going to cause them to continue having to deal with him after the crew gets together. The mistake is then compounded by allowing the coach to continue coming out to them and arguing the call. He should have immediately been warned that he was going to be restricted to the dugout, and then as soon as he continued coming, restricted. And since it hasn't happened already, this point here could have resulted in a restriction as well. In this next play, we're going to take a scenario with runners on first and third and one out. There's a lot we could break down on this play, but let's just focus on the base umpire. First, we need to think about our body language, especially when we're interacting with coaches. We should never put our hands in our pockets, and this umpire should focus on keeping his chin up and focus towards the coach. Now, even if this umpire had positioned himself to the best position possible in a crew of two, that's still not going to be the best position we could ever have on a play at third base. So, it's not unreasonable to quickly go to your partner for help on this play after being asked to do so by the coach. And again, the body language on this umpire is poor, but after we've talked with the coach and agreed to go consult with the other umpire, that's when the conversation with the coach needs to end. There's no reason to keep talking with him. Jog to the other umpire so that you can have the discussion, but end it with the coach. Now we see the crew getting together, and the only thing I would say here is that I'd rather see the crew more in fair territory on this, which would have happened had the plate umpire been more proactive in going to meet his partner instead of have his partner come so far to him. The base umpire, after discussing with the plate umpire, decides to overturn his call, which I think ultimately is right. Now when the coach the call is going against comes out, I'd like to see our base umpire move a little more quickly to meet the coach. The umpire does a good job here explaining to the coach the advantages and disadvantages of the angle he had and why it was advantageous to talk to the plate umpire and what information the other umpire was able to provide. Remember, after the consultation, the ruling is final. The coach can't come out and argue, but he can ask why the decision was made. This interaction goes on a little too long and the umpire misses a great opportunity to let the coach go back to the dugout. Finally, when the discussion with the coach ends, there's no reason to address anything from his dugout unless it's going to be worthy of an ejection. The base umpire should jog back to his position and get ready for the next play. For this last play, we're going to have a runner on third base and two outs. The ball's hit to the shortstop on this play, and our base umpire does a good job recognizing that this play will go into first base and getting across the infield to get as close as possible for this play. The initial ruling is safe and that there was no tag. And while the umpire did the best to his abilities to get over and get into position for this play, it's certainly not as good of a position as we would have had in a crew of three or a crew of four with an umpire starting in the A position. 
Now, when the coach comes out, we want to be confident, but also open and non-defensive in our body language. This discussion with the coach is fairly quick. A brief discussion of the call, and then being open to seeing if your partner has additional information from their different angle than you were able to get on the play. After agreeing to a crew consultation, the coach tries to talk with his team while the umpires get together. The base umpire does a good job recognizing this and instructing him that for the consultation to occur, he has to go back to his dugout. This is preventative umpiring because if we don't overturn the call, we don't want the coach standing exactly where we have to go. By having him back in the dugout, there will be no continued discussion about the play. So now that we've reviewed the rules, let's cover this week's case plays. Case play number one. R1, no outs. A ground ball is hit to F5, who throws across the infield to F3. F3 comes off the bag and attempts a swipe tag to get the batter runner. The base umpire rules no tag and that the batter runner is safe. The defensive coach comes out to the area behind the mound and asks the base umpire to check with the plate umpire. The base umpire agrees. Where can the defensive coach stand now? The dugout? The coach's box? Anywhere in fair territory away from the umpires? At the mound for a mound visit, included in the discussion with the umpires, anywhere in foul territory away from the umpires. There is only one correct answer here, and that answer is that the defensive coach can only stay in the dugout. We don't want them to be out of the dugout and on the field when we get together for a consultation, because after the consultation, there's no discussion left to be had about the play. They need to go back to the dugout before we get together. This will help reduce arguments and ejections. Case play number two. The head coach of the home team thinks the umpire from the A position missed a close play at first base. There's no question about the ball being dropped or if the first baseman pulled his foot. The base umpire had a clear view of the play. The manager of the home team comes out and asks the base umpire to get help from the plate umpire. Is this A, the umpire should immediately go and ask his partner for help, B, the umpire should deny the coach's request to get help, or C, the umpire should only get help if the manager requests it within 30 seconds of the play ending. The correct answer here is that the umpire should deny the coach's request to get help. In this scenario, this is a judgment call, and with the first base umpire being in the A position, which is the best position possible to make this call, we're going to stay with their call. Case play number three. The base umpire from the middle has a close play on a back pick at third base and calls the runner out. The umpire believes the angle he had was the best angle possible, but that his partner behind the plate may have additional insight to the play. When can the base umpire go to their partner? A. Immediately after the play. B. When the coach comes out to ask about the play. Or C. Not until the coach and him discuss the entire play and whether the umpire's judgment was correct. This question was a little difficult to understand. But the correct answer is going to be that the umpire should get together after being asked to do so by the coach. We aren't immediately going to go to our partner because we don't know whether or not our partner even saw the play, and we want to show confidence in the call that we did make. That said, if the coach does come out and the first thing they ask is if you can get help from your partner, if you feel that you might be able to get better information from them, then go ahead and have that consultation. Do not have a long discussion with the coach. Just agree to go have a crew consultation and tell the coach he has to go back to his position before we will have the consultation. Case play number four. A close play happens at third base and is ruled safe by the base umpire. The head coach of the defense requests and is granted time and comes out to the plate umpire requesting them to give help on the play. Is this A, the plate umpire should immediately give a ruling, B, the plate umpire should call her partner in from the field to discuss the play, or C, the plate umpire should direct the coach to speak with the base umpire about the call. The correct answer here is C. If you are not the calling umpire, you're not going to discuss the play with the coach. Instruct the coach that if they have a question about the call, they need to go to the umpire that made the call. Then if that umpire feels like they wanna to come to you for help, let them do so. Case play number five. We have a crew of three umpires with you three as the crew chief. We have a runner on second and one out. The base umpires are on the third base foul line and in the deep B position. B3 hits a ground ball to F5, who throws across the infield to F3. U1 rules the ball, beat the batter runner to first. The offensive coach comes out and asks the base umpire to get help on a potential pulled foot by F3. The umpire wants to get help and should A. Jog to the plate umpire and quickly ask if they had a pulled foot. 
B, bring the entire crew together to discuss the play. The correct answer here is B. Anytime we're having a crew consultation, we need all the umpires on the crew to be in that consultation. That's important for two reasons. First, we never know when an unlikely umpire is going to have key input on a play. And second, by bringing the whole crew together, we can discuss when we're going to overturn the call, how we're going to handle the situation, and how we're going to tell the coaches about the change. Case play number six. This situation is the same, except this time the crew gets together and determines to stay with the call. The offensive coach requests time in a calm manner to discuss the call with the played umpire. Is this A, the request for time should be denied if the coach continues to come out to discuss the play, they are restricted to the dugout and then subject to ejection. B, they are immediately ejected. C, this is legal so long as they are non-combative and polite. The correct answer here is A. The offensive coach is the one that asks that we get together for a crew consultation. After doing that and not overturning the call, there's nothing more for them to ask or discuss with us. If they start to do so, we should immediately give them a stop and tell them not to come any further. If they continue, immediately restrict them to the dugout, and then if it keeps going from there, they will be ejected. Case play number seven. Again, we have the same situation, but this time the crew gets together and determines F3 pulled their foot off the bag before receiving the ball. So they will change the call to safe. Who will signal the change? Is it the plate umpire, the first base umpire, or the third base umpire that is also the crew chief. The correct answer here is B. The first base umpire, the umpire that made the original decision, will ultimately be the one to give the final decision. Case play number eight. Again, we have the same situation where the crew gets together and determines F3 pulled their foot off the bag before receiving the ball. Thus, they're going to overturn the call. The defensive coach wants to ask why the call was changed. Who should they go to? A, the plate umpire, B, the first base umpire, C, the third base umpire, who is also the crew chief. D, they cannot come out and will immediately be ejected. The correct answer here is B. If we change the original call, then the coach that the call is going against is entitled to an explanation of the ruling. However, they are not allowed to argue as the reason we're getting together is to ultimately get the call right. Case play number nine. Again, we have the same situation with the crew getting together and overturning the call to save. The crew knows the defensive coach will likely want an explanation of the change. Can the crew inform the defensive coach of the change before signaling the change? Is this A, they're required to tell the coach of the coming change before signaling it, B, it is up to the crew, or C, they may not tell the coach until after they signal the reverse call? The correct answer here is B. When the umpires are overturning a call, they always have the option of when they want to tell the coach that the call will be going against. When the call is more complex or will probably be more surprising to the coach, then it's a good idea to get together before signaling the change. But if it's obvious why the umpires are overturning the call, then we don't need to get together to have that discussion before. The coach is still entitled to an explanation after, but there might not be a reason to have the conversation before signaling it. Case play number 10. R1 is stealing with a 3-1 count on the batter. The next pitch is called ball four, but the catcher throws the ball to second base anyway, and the runner is tagged before reaching the base. The base umpire erroneously calls the runner out, and the runner, believing he is out, steps off the bag and again tagged by the fielder. Is this A, R1 is safe at second base, or B, R1 is out for leaving the base? The correct answer here is A, R1 is going to be safe at second base. The umpires are ultimately going to do what's needed to be done to get the play right had the call been made correctly the first time. Since R1 was awarded second base on the walk by the batter runner, then R1 should have originally been safe at second. And because the umpire made the original error that caused him to come off the base the second time and get tagged, we're going to ignore that tag. R1 will be placed at second base and there are no outs on this play. So there you have it, our review of crew consultations. If you found this video helpful, please share our videos with other umpires. Also, you can help me produce more content by sending your game pictures and videos to media at umpireclassroom.com or by sending your rules questions and case plays to me at patrick at umpireclassroom.com. Thanks again for watching, and as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.